welcome back to Beyond Trauma, a guide for your healing journey. Today, uh, I am here with Jen, and we are going to start season four. Yes, we are. Yes, I'm with excited. a very special, <laughs> it's kind of like a, season four came out of conversation I had with people about what we were doing in season three, mm-hmm. um, which is like, what do you want to hear on the podcast? Yeah. And we've gotten a lot of interest in both like our therapist community. And then I think a lot of us use this tool inside our client community as well. Uh, But we're going to talk on this season entirely about the Enneagram. Not just the Enneagram. Right. Like it's, to me, I think what makes me so excited about it is I've heard so many podcast episodes and speakers and books. read articles and books and yeah. all, of, all, all of those things. But the thing I'm excited about is the way that we talk about the Enneagram yeah. as a little bit it's different. different. Um, still staying like true to the Enneagram, but then taking it like next level. Yeah. And so everything that we've been talking about on this podcast for the last couple of seasons now being able to use that same language and that same understanding and connect it with a tool as powerful as the Enneagram. Yeah. And I love just where this season is coming, like to talk about the Enneagram after everything that we've talked about, like to talk about trauma to talk about dissociation and personality traits and strategies and all of that language. Because with that understanding, I think you're going to get so much more Mm -hmm. out of the Enneagram than just thinking about it as a personality Right. Like assessment or something to use like you know with your friends or yeah. you know, sometimes with your partners um but there's a lot to unpack even before we start talking mm-hmm. about the enneagram um i'm curious like where you heard about the enneagram if, or if you remember when so, you so a good friend of mine who's actually coming to visit this weekend so oh cool a best friend of mine um clear back from high school has been really into the enneagram and read on it is it called like coaching or mentoring? Uh Enneagram coaching. She's Uh gone through like trainings and processes like that. And so she had talked to me about it like way before beyond. Um, And it was like, oh, that's really interesting. That's cool. Kind of in the same category for me as like astrology. Like, oh, Oh, I'm really interested. I want to hear about it. But it doesn't stick. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Not like, at all. <laughs> and I think I maybe got a book after she had talked about it and started reading it. Probably didn't. I'm certain I didn't finish it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just like, that's really interesting. Cool. I remember taking the assessment. Um, and that Okay. Made... So that was like the first way you learned your type. Yeah. I took a self-assessment okay. Okay. online. Okay. A test. That thing was pretty thorough. Yeah. But was, you know, had an experience of reading it and being like, whoa, wow, it's cool to be seen. And like, that pisses me off a little. Like, yeah. I don't think I like certain parts of this. Yeah. And, um, but then it just kind of faded after that. I didn't talk What do you feel about more. it? Like, what do you feel it was that made it not something that captivated your interest? Like, why do you feel like it just came and went in I your life? I think that's a good question. Maybe the lack of, for me, I need things to be integrated into like real life application yeah, and like the reiteration of taking a concept or a tool and seeing it come to life in my relationships right now and my interactions. Yeah. Otherwise it just kind of goes in a category of another neat thing I learned that I could maybe reference back to at some point, but it was really coming into relationship with you yeah. that like brought it to life. Uh, like we just started talking about yeah. types all of the time. Yeah. And, and even with like our relationship, you know, I would say it wasn't really until a year ago that I felt you become more interested in mm-hmm. it past like, because in previous conversations years ago, when we would talk about it, it was like, you know, yeah, I know about it and it's interesting and oh so what is that part again and this part like you were clearly very curious about it but it really wasn't until you know maybe six or seven eight months ago that you really in my mind started to think about it on your own Mm -hmm. like in your daily life and trying to think through like yeah this has more power than just like a Myers-Briggs or you know something that's just a a more simple um, understanding of personality structure. And I think the more we've developed our 
model of case conceptualization that we use at, um, in our company, the more it's easy to see how clearly connected with a lot of the language that we use with like strategy and past life experiences that are really shaping and forming yeah. who we show up as as humans today. Yeah. And then the Enneagram gave an added layer of vocabulary quick and easy reference like I can say like oh a two thing or a seven thing mm -hmm. and I we know a cluster of what we're talking about yeah it represents this like cluster of strategies um rather than having to go through and list them and it just became a really easy way to start to talk about themes and kind of clusters of presentation yeah that's one piece that I love about the Enneagram is that even with just the naming of a type which we we talk about the types from number not by the names that are sometimes given, which I don't know if you've noticed that like I don't use the names mm -hmm. like yeah. two as helper. And I'll be or, like, oh, what, which one is that? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, and like, <laughs> but what do you mean it doesn't <laughs> yeah. matter? Yeah. But I really do think the names obscure what is really going on because the name is a label. And you have your own assumptions yeah. of what that is. Like must two mean. is called the helper, one, the perfectionist, three, the achiever. Mm -hmm. Like these things color your perspective of the type before you really even yeah. hear them out for like what their core kind of things they're struggling with are or how their strategies really even work. Yeah. Um, like nines are the peacemakers. It's like, if you think about that with the nines that you know in your life, like, yeah, that they definitely like harmony, but are they actually going out and searching for spaces to make peace in? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, going to come like yeah, that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So there's there's so much more depth I think that can be found when you let the curiosity remain when you just talk about it from the number standpoint. So yeah. um, that's just one piece. But when you can name a number and start to feel what that number feels, mm -hmm. that's really where you you can start to understand the strategies so much easier. Yeah. Like when sevens are avoiding pain and running from thing to thing to thing. Mm -hmm. Like you can feel into that space and feel how terrified they are. Yeah. And how amazing their life can look on the outside because they're just running around right. from thing to thing. Um, but when you dig deeper, even past just the, the number and some of the core energies, it really does map out an amazing you know, kind of uh, topography of what a person has come to discover as their way of being in the world. Right. Um, I had a conversation yesterday where the person was talking about their Enneagram style. It's like the way that I roll, like mm -hmm. this is like what I do and I don't know how or why, but this is just what it is. Yep. Like this is just how I behave, how I think of myself, how I think about other people. And so there's some clear there's some clear connections between things like attachment theory and how we understand trauma um, emerging in one's life and how you then were changed mm -hmm. by those experiences and what ways you what ways you adapted to it. Um, so I'm curious for you now as you're coming to this conversation, like what are you interested in with the Enneagram? Well, there's things for this episode or this series, there's things I'm really interested in us getting to share mm. with our listeners. And some of that being like messages I've taken from that of there's not a good type and a bad type. And you tell oh. me this like yes. all the time, <laughs> <laughs> which is in such alignment with there's not like a good strategy or a bad strategy to life or way mm -hmm. to navigate life. Mm -hmm. And I think to me, as we go through and see the, versatility of each type yeah. and really talk about it. The Enneagram is so complex yes. and has so much just like beauty and the diversity of numbers and, and all that shows up there that it's easy to want to categorize and say, well, this is bad or mm -hmm. this is good, but to really stay open to that being um, not a good or a bad construct in that. But yeah. each side has it's adaptive nature and benefits, and then each number has its own limitations, and I think they call it the shadows yep. of each number. So that's a huge message I want to keep like talking about in the theme mm -hmm. of all of this um, mm -hmm. as we go through. For me, I'm excited to to continue to talk about and break down each number, and then be able to connect it and associate it to like real life relationship totally. experiences. And I hope that our listeners will get that same experience that it won't just be the overwhelming. 
information about a number but like yeah. the embodiment of like what it feels like and what yeah. it feels like to interact with someone yeah with those types do you feel i didn't ask you about this before coming on to the episode but do you feel okay to talk about your personal experience totally. with the enneagram because oh, yeah. it's it's interesting here it's recently active right yeah now. <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about like what your process has been here i mean like very you recently. could probably talk about it better than <laughs> I'm going to join in. I'm going to join in for sure. But I think that this, the reason I want to talk about it is that the Enneagram is a tool for self discovery. Yeah. It's not inherently about like, you know, a lot of Enneagram coaching culture talks about it as like growth mm -hmm. and that it's about your strengths and it's about like pursuing better, yeah, like your becoming path. better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's not where the Enneagram came from, and it's not really what the Enneagram is about at its core. It's about discovery and really illuminating where your, you know, your heart and mind are in dealing with the world that you came to know as a child, yeah. and how you then saw yourself in having worth or having no worth, and having, you know, roles and responsibilities, or being the one who doesn't have any roles or responsibilities. Yeah. And how you then are kind of working your way into adult life and are you pursuing the things that you care about? Are you living for other people? Mm -hmm. Like all of these things are at the core of the Enneagram, not just because you're supposed to grow. Yeah. You know, that's a very like Western way of understanding the Enneagram that it's about achievement and growth, right. like a three culture. <laughs> or what do I do now that I know that like all the shadows and I know all the parts of this, what do I do now? Right. How do I, how do I change? Yeah. How do I get rid of those shadows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's Which I still do that. The... <laughs> I'm like still waiting for that part of the chapter. <laughs> but it never comes. Like you never get to that part of the book. Yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So your own, your own experience here, like when yeah. you took the test years ago, did you get a two then? Got a two. Got a two then. Yep. Okay. A two wing three. Okay. And I'm really highlighting like a lot of the emphasis in the, like the written portion that I described it was on that like stress path of an eight mm -hmm. and how, like how profound that shows up for me. Yeah. And so, yeah. So felt very seen by that. Yeah. And, and really when there was a section in the test that I took that said like, I think it was titled like, how did you get here like mm -hmm, how did you mm -hmm. and it gave a lot of like hypotheses on like me, likely you may have, have faced been. like a life like a family or a home like such and such and some of what it described i was like oh yeah very much so yeah um as it described the two nature yeah. and very much had that like oh that was very much my dynamic with my mom, you know, my mom and sister's relationship and then me being a younger child and mm -hmm. like my mom and my relationship and all of that. And so it fit. Yeah. It fit well. Yeah. And I think there were parts, I'm trying to remember now, parts of that that didn't quite fit. Like I didn't feel total alignment, but I think that's in all of them. Like it's, it's so robust and mm -hmm. like how it describes it was kind of like, well, I don't know if I resonate as much with that piece or, mm. um, yeah. but through that then in like being with you and Melissa and just like talking about our different types and seeing how they come up and figuring out how to describe different feelings I had and like patterns yeah. and behaviors. And which type helped validate the type of feeling and its origin. Yes you know, what could we trace the way you were feeling and some of the tension you were experiencing? Could yeah. we, could we speak to that through a type? Yes. Yeah. And I think being able to identify as a two very much like revealed parts of myself through that, that helped me like this process of self-discovery around those strategies Yeah. and that being present. And then more recently exploring like a whole nother type yeah. That is interesting because there's still parts of the two that I feel like describe mm -hmm. like my strategies that I have available to me and, and things that I'll utilize in relationships or way that I think and feel. But to identify with a type one illuminated this whole other world yeah. that was like two doesn't describe any bit of this yeah. about myself. 
And it's so profound in who I am that I don't even like see it yeah. until recently. Yes. It's so just it's like, like right under my nose. Yeah. It's, it's like the skin you wear. Like, yeah. it's just like, you don't really think about it, but it's there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so that's kind of the journey now of like, well, what is a one? One has never even been a type I've known uh-huh. or looked at. We've never t- like talked about friendships or associations with a one before. Yep. So in that exploration was like, what is even a one? Right. Like, what what does it even mean? Yeah. Yes. The perfectionist yeah. is the name. And but... I would not really probably identify myself as a perfectionist. Exactly. Yes. I don't think you are in the traditional sense, but there are some things, which is where the one gets its name, where you have an amazing demand for precision, for excellence, for, you know, without compromise, this will be what it needs to be. Here's how much of a one <laughs> I in this way is like to be a perfectionist wouldn't be a perfect image. <laughs> oh man. Seriously. That's though, amazing. I would never identify as a perfectionist. Right, because that's not because a... like a perfectionist is like tightly wound and yeah, like anal retentive. And a, yeah, and a, yeah, no, 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 no. So like that wouldn't be a perfect enough image to accept. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Like, and that's really where, you know, in working with the Enneagram, I've, I've worked with the Enneagram. I came to know about it in high school. Like I, I am the type that like YouTube to me was not about watching silly videos. Like YouTube to Wait, me. you had YouTube in high school? Y- yes. I was not. That was like a thing to like search YouTube. That's what I did with it. I didn't have that. Yeah. <laughs> so like, funny. Okay, you had sorry. YouTube available to you. No. Yes, you did. When I was in high school, yes. it was not like a popular search engine. It wasn't a popular search engine when I was in high school either. Okay. But did you the people Well, nobody that I knew was using it like that. Like people okay. would upload things to YouTube to like show amazing like and this is again like high school, like um like video game screening or um streaming was just getting off the ground. Uh-huh. Like People were doing things like um, trick shots on YouTube and making these like silly videos to post and do like things like that. This is such a tangent. I feel like the first YouTube video that I like was Charlie bit my finger. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if you like, that's the first. But I was like married in my own home by then. That's amazing. By the time I was exposed to that, that's wild. That anyway, is wild. That is ahead. wild. But okay. <laughs> so for me, I kind of stumbled on to this side of I always wanted to learn like I just wanted more and more information and I found these um like I was really into like Buddhist philosophy at the time and so there were these like recorded meditations and things that I would watch Mm -hmm. I stumbled across Richard Rohr uh this is a video recording that somebody had uploaded from the 90s um and it was a five-part video series overviewing this thing called the Enneagram. No way. Yeah. Wow. He can still find these. He is wearing a, a gray suit and there's a green chalkboard behind him, um, which is amazing because he draws it all out on the yeah. chalkboard. And it's from the um, the center that he uh, lives at in Arizona, I believe is where it's at, or New Mexico. I can't remember which one. New Mexico, Tyler? Okay. Do you remember what it's called? Uh, the Center for... Contemplation. contemplation yeah yeah mm. yes care and contemplation or something like that i can't remember but um in that uh in that center he would have retreats where people would come and learn the enneagram and in this one uh in this one series that he put together they had it recorded and he would sell vhs's of this like back they would come for ago. a retreat and just to learn, learn it to educationally learn the, or yes. like personal exploration with Both. the Enneagram. Like they would do That's lecture series idea. and yeah, with Richard Rohr, like one of the, like, um, you know, one of, one of the most impactful um, Christian mystics like of our mm-hmm. modern age. Um, so that was really where, you know, and I'm like 17 years old, like just like thinking through this yeah. um, thing. And, you know, that was a lot of the identity that I felt was really authentic to me, but it was something that I could do like on my own. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't have conversations with my friends about this types of thing. Podcasts weren't really a thing at that point in my life. Like I didn't really, I had heard about podcasts before, but I never really knew Mm -hmm. that that same type of thing could live there. Um, So the YouTube video was something that I watched like over and over and over and over again. Yeah. So 
Is that because you felt like it, it was a, like a complex theory that you were excited to learn about intellectually or because you felt like it like spoke to you both personally. and that's where there's not much of a division for me with learning like i'm interesting yeah like yeah. i'm it, it's like right there like the reason is i get so excited thing? about is that a five thing yeah i don't know jen well i have to like explore, <laughs> explore this that. okay but it it really does feel to me like when i'm learning i am exploring myself at the same time mm -hmm. and that really goes to show like what i was interested in at that time in my life at 17 was <laughs> psychotherapy from freud and darwin's biology like that was i was jacked on those <laughs> things um at that That's time of my life so for this to come along, especially with my like interest in meditation and um, some of these uh, spirit ways of kind of spiritual expression in Buddhism, it was such an amazing, like it just felt like it was like dropped yeah. into my lap. Like it was such an amazing uh, meeting place for all of these parts of myself to come and say like, oh, there's a system that I can yeah. learn of personality that has origins and in interpersonal relationships and a spiritual connection. Like I'm in. Yeah. So it just became like my version of Netflix. <laughs> um, like back, At like 18? Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Back then, Netflix was still sending out, uh, they didn't have streaming yet. They had the, the DVDs in the mail. DVDs in the mail. <laughs> yeah. That, that's wow. what it was. Yeah. yeah. And you had to wait like five or six days when you chose one. And then you mail them back. You got to keep Before the sleeve. Before you get your next one. They're going to charge you extra <laughs> if you don't keep the sleeve. Uh, to the Gen Z folks, mm -hmm. they're not gonna know. But <laughs> yeah. Just Google it; like it's there. Like, um, but in in understanding that, the first time it became something more than just my YouTube like watching experience was in college. So uh, I heard somebody just like mention their Enneagram type, and it just like what? Like that too? Yeah, exactly. So I had this like moment of like. Oh my gosh, like childlike wonder. Wow. And the way that they talked about it was so not how I had experienced it. Like they mm. were talking about it as like what Richard Rohr would call like a parlor game. Okay. Like they were talking about it as just like, oh, you're probably this, or you're this, like you're that. And it was mm -hmm. just like, oh no, like this is so not it. So I, which I wonder what you'll think about this. At 18 years old, freshman on campus, I organized an Enneagram group. And we started talking about the Enneagram together. How many people came? Uh, there was like five or six in my dorm that okay. were really interested in it. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was pretty cool. But that was like my first time basically just sharing what I had learned from Richard Rohr on the YouTube videos. And I would like send them to people to watch. And they were just like, how do you like watch these? Like, these are so <laughs> like, like, this is amazing content. What do you mean? How do I watch this? But um, it illuminated to me that there would be some who see the Enneagram as just this like shallow kind of, you know, personality assessment, but then you could engage with the Enneagram in a way that was like a spiritual wisdom mm -hmm. tradition. And that was the way that I came to, to understand the Enneagram. I feel like that is more, as you're describing that, the idea of it, as I compare it to just like any other personality assessment, like, oh, it's just information I'll set aside. Yeah. Was it being just... It didn't have that deeper component that you're describing, like the way that you see it. It's been yeah. in seeing it through those lenses and talking about it in that way. Yes. That's like, it comes alive within you. Like it's in my brain so often as I'm yeah. talking to people and I'm like seeing myself mm -hmm. through these types and like being able to just express and talk more explicitly about things. I to put language myself, to things that you like before, yeah. just there's no way. No way. You could have kind of articulated some of the most intricate of mm -hmm. nuances within yourself. Yeah. Um, and in the relationships that you have. Yeah. Yeah. And it really is when you come into a relationship with someone else that has that shared language. Oh man. Oh, it's just like, I can say this and you'll know all those intricate details. Like you'll get them. Yes. And you'll see me in that way. Yes. And I don't have to try to like explain it and express it. It's like, it's a neat way of connecting. Yeah. So for those that are listening, we haven't actually described what the Enneagram is yet, which oh, I love that. <laughs> no, no. I think it's right. I think it's supposed to happen that way. Um, come to it relationally first. Let's break really quick. Oh, okay. We'll have um, a little short ad that will share with you some of the things that we're doing here at Beyond and ways to get connected with us. 
And then when we come back, we can actually describe what the Great Instagram job, Jen. Is. You did your role this game. <laughs> yes, a short ad. Yes. Hey, thanks for watching this YouTube video. A couple more things before you go. Be sure to like and subscribe. And if you have time, leave a comment below as those things really help boost the ratings of the video and get this content to the people that would appreciate it and find it meaningful or interesting and may need it in their, in their daily life or in their practice. There's also gonna be links in the description of the video as well as somewhere I'm sure on the screen of our website, connectbeyondhealing.com uh, where you'll find information on all things beyond. Uh, including our Think Beyond uh, Media, as well as the, the podcasts, the Beyond Healing Center and the therapy side, and the Institute where all the wonderful trainings happen. You'll also uh, see links for something called Beyond Healing Community, which is essentially our own social media, uh, where you'll find information on uh, ways to connect with therapists from all over the world about techniques, including EMDR and somatic experiencing, nervous system informed protocols, and uh, the power of the healing relationship and inner subjectivity. So if you have time, engage with us further and have fun. Okay, let's actually talk about what the Enneagram even is. Yes. Now that we've spent like, what, 25 minutes? Right. Talking all about it. Talking about it, which yeah. again, I will say again, I did this before the ad, like the, the way I think you should come to the Enneagram and really the way that I think you should stay with the Enneagram is through relationship. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, I understand the utility of the assessments, but that's not the way. Mm -hmm. Like the Enneagram was first a tool for spiritual directors in Catholic and Christian theology. So mm -hmm. it's not something that it's like a questionnaire that you fill out and you get your type. It's yeah. something to be discovered and really wrestled with. Um, as you're as you're coming to know your type, so I think it's right that we talked about the relationship side first and the meaning that we find in it, mm -hmm. and then we can introduce the actual diagram. Um, so if you've ever seen the enneagram, and we're going to have links in the show notes for you all um, to some sites that are really wonderful. But if you've ever seen a picture of the enneagram, you know it's an it's a pentagram is a nine pointed uh, star. And there are the connection paths between each of the each of the points that are really important. So in that nine pointed star, they're divided into three uh, subgroups. So you have the head triad, the heart triad, and the gut triad. And again, we're going to get into so much of this as we go throughout the season, um, talking about the meaning of these triads, what some of their core kind of ideas are that they're working through and the ways that they're skewing their perspective of reality. But as we get into the nine, the nine types and their subgroups, you have, you have different things that have been called so many different things of passions or fixations or habits mm -hmm. or shadows um, that each of these, each of these groups struggle with. Um, but just for conversation's sake, the gut triad, their kind of core struggle that they're dealing with is anger. The heart triad, the core struggle they're dealing with is shame, and the head triad, the core struggle they're dealing with is fear. So, what's important to know about this, um, you know, these these different feelings and the things that these types are working through, is that the individual types deal with that in a different way. Mm. So, if we're looking back at the gut triad, the way eight, nine, and one, which are a part of the gut triad, the way each of those types deals with anger is very different. For the heart triad with two, three, and four, the way they deal with shame is very different. And for five, six, and sevens in the head triad, the way they deal with fear is very different. Mm. So what are you what are you thinking as I'm describing some of this initial well, just my, visualization? My, I don't know if this is relevant at all, but my brain's going to the neurobiology of Oh yeah, head, heart, and gut. Yes. Yeah. Dan Siegel is a big proponent of the Enneagram. Okay. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear. Him yeah, like he just did a foreword to a book. Um, the, oh, what is it? Oh, we'll link it in the show notes. I can't remember the title off of my head, off the top of my head, but he did the foreword to this book on the Enneagram. Okay. And he uses it in his psychotherapy practice. Oh, I would love to hear that. Because oh, I'm yeah. thinking head, heart, and gut. And then you said fear, shame, and anger. And anger. And just the affective circuits that I don't know, yeah. my brain just yeah. was spinning on that. Yes, for a minute. it's beautiful to think about. It yeah. really, really is. Yes. 
Um, so in this season, what we're going to do is, you know, talk about the system of the Enneagram um, in some of the upcoming episodes. And the way we're going to do that is to talk about each triad, and we'll mention some information on, on each of the types. Um, but then also how the paths between the types mm -hmm. work because there's stress and growth paths. Some people, I just had a conversation yesterday, a guy who's taught the Enneagram for, for many years doesn't believe that there's a stress and growth path. He says the connections are very important, but really it's not that you go to one and stress and you go to the other in growth. That's interesting. It is interesting. I still personally am a big proponent of understanding the growth and stress paths just because that's how I was... That's how Richard Rohr taught it. So that's how my brain is just naturally would came you, to it. Would you equate that to where I go when I feel safe versus where I go when I'm in threat, like feel threatened or unsafe? That's how you can understand stress and growth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, the, the Enneagram is all about resources. So as you are one of the types, we all are. That's one of the things Richard Rohr says. He says, I don't know why and I don't know how, but somehow we are all one of these nine types. Like... It, it, it just fits. It's just the way that it is. Um, and to hear a mystic say something like that is mm -hmm. pretty cool. But um, in the type that you are, you have so many resources available to you. Um, and you can conceptualize those both through your wings. So that's on, what's mm -hmm. on either side of you as your type. Um, again, it's a circle of nine types that you then, if you're a nine, you have an eight and a one on either side of you and so mm -hmm. on throughout the rest of the types. But you also have available to you the, the numbers that you're connected to through mm -hmm. the paths of the nine-pointed star. So that's really where when you're looking at what a person may be experiencing in a given situation, the Enneagram offers something that I have not encountered in any other wisdom tradition or a personality assessment to really look at how their system internally is functioning and what that's looking like mm -hmm. on the outside, um, the strategies that are being employed uh, hmm. for that. So the way, um, and you'll, the listeners will, will hear an interview that I did yesterday um, on the next episode um, with an Enneagram coach that talks about it. It's not so much that you have a stress and a growth path, but you have the high side of each number, so the healthy, beautiful mm -hmm. attributes, and you have the low side of each number, which is the core you know, habits or the fixations. Sometimes yeah. they're called the struggles that those numbers go through. And so if you're experiencing a point of your if you're experiencing a point of your life where you're going through stress or you're experiencing a lot of dysfunction or 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 you know distress. You need to look again at the high side of your type and what high sides you have available to you and see if some of those things can start to create the change that you're looking mm -hmm. for in your life. Mm -hmm. um, so for me as a two, if I'm working through a system that I find myself in often where I'm feeling completely exhausted and like I have you know, no time for myself and I've just given away all of my, all of my energy to other things, I can start to look to the high side of the eight and say like, oh, I need to actually be about boundaries and strength mm -hmm. and togetherness and nurturance and provision, both for myself and those that I'm around. And I can also look to the high side of the four and see beautiful creativity and focusing on self-exploration and just letting the poetry emerge as so often does in, in the type four. Um, but for me, I still really resonate with the stress and growth path mm -hmm. personally. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting another interesting perspective on it. And my brain keeps trying to associate language that we use a lot with like strategy. Yeah. It's all and, about, and when I said like the resources, it is all about strategy. Yeah. Like you have so many strategies available to you to yeah. deal with the situation that you're in. And I'm sure that varies depending on one, your own personal like capacity activation, but your environment, the people you're around, like mm -hmm. the strategy that you end up employing in a certain situation, I'm sure has so many variables because yeah. you have a variety of them available to you. Absolutely. And especially when you're then around other people who are themselves types on the Enneagram, mm -hmm. you now have sometimes less opportunity for strategy to emerge, but in some of the combinations, you have more strategy that yeah. can come to emerge. 
Um, and that's where when we start talking about relationships within the Enneagram later in the season, I think we'll really start to see some interesting both like dissonance and resonance that can emerge in relationships because certain types often find each other. Mm -hmm. Again, Richard Rohr would say like, I don't know why it is that way. It just is that way. Mm -hmm. Like that's just how it is. And then when you see some types that, you know, some relationships that don't go well or that constantly create friction or they get into really codependent strategies with each other, you can start to see certain types becoming more likely to get into those types of relationships. Have you ever overlapped like attachment well, styles? Well, there's not a clear like this type is a, is you know dismissive or avoidant. All of the types can be secure or insecure. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to look at it that way because as a, a two myself and my wife Olivia is a two, as you know, and I am a dismissive two, mm-hmm. introverted. And she is an extroverted, preoccupied too. Mm -hmm. We look very different at times. (laughs) But some of the things we're dealing with at the very core are very similar. Yeah. Um, And the way we give energy to other people and never to ourselves. And It makes me wonder if the attachment styles or patterns would more so overlap less about the type and more about the strategy they lean to. Absolutely. If you would see that kind of correlation. Yeah. And I, I think that... For me, just using kind of myself as a as an example, the two, I recognized a lot of my early life um, as being where I lived in my eight a lot. And that was because I had like, you know, I was a pretty cold person on the outside because of a lot of the things I was dealing with, um, with my mom kind of being in and out and, and my dad being more of a friend than a dad. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I still cared about relationships and would still want to, you know, laugh and and have fun with people and and really try to have that sense of stability in yeah. relationships. And I would, you know, in high school, I was a part of volunteer organizations. I was still doing all these two things, trying to create dependence on me. But I loved your comment about perfection being, you know, not a perfect label. Yeah. Yeah. I, as a two, use that same strategy. Like, no, I don't want you to think I'm trying to help you. I'm creating a space that you can't live without, mm-hmm. but you don't know that I did it. Mm-hmm. And that makes me the most secure ever mm-hmm. because you can't look to where the person You'll was. You'll never see the link to try to break You'll it. You'll never yeah. see it. Exactly. That's a great way to say it. You'll never see the link to try and break it. That's like the Jedi level of my type mm-hmm. for me. It's like, can I meet all of your needs without you knowing that I did that? Yeah. Oh, that's like perfect Mm -hmm. because you're going to start to struggle and you're not going to know where to turn. And then I will just engineer another way that I can like create this support that you just naturally find. And then, oh, yay. (laughs) And I get to know. And then I get to have the card that says like, well, you never recognized me for anything. Like Mm -hmm. I was the one that was like, (laughs) you don't even know the things I do. Okay. (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. Very funny. Hey, it's actually quite vulnerable what we're saying here. It is here. extremely vulnerable. <laughs> we're saying it very like flippantly, but as as our listeners are like maybe exploring themselves in this process, yeah, it's it is a lot to reveal. The, I like how you say the Jedi level of our numbers. Yes, to reveal the Jedi level because of our that shadow. Is, yeah, like, that we don't even is, know we're doing it, and that is so uh, exposing to let someone in on. Yes. Those secret strategies. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to meet you there because you did with yours of the <laughs> perfection. <appreciate> <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, but I think that that's, that's really what, you know, I'm excited to get into this season. And I, I have a feeling it's going to be a long season because even now, as we're talking, I'm thinking so of talk we have about. so many beautiful Enneagram types in our relationships yeah. here at Beyond. Like, we need Should Tyler, bring them the, on the cameraman. Podcast. He's a nine. You and right me there. are token nine. <laughs> we'll bring you and Caleb token in. <laughs> and Connor. And we like, have a lot of nines. We do have a lot yeah. of nines. Nines make great listeners. Uh, Good therapists. So, yeah. And, and storytellers, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, you know, I think that the richness of the Enneagram emerges in relationship. And that's mm-hmm. that's really what I'm I'm excited to talk about. Yeah. This is going to be a good season. I'm very excited. Yeah. So we'll go over the Enneagram through the triads and talk about each type. There's some amazing resources that we'll share uh, in the show notes and um, in uh, different ways as we can that help really round out um, some of the Enneagram. Sleeping at last is a great Mm -hmm. um, 
album that was put together of the Enneagram where there's a, there's a musical score and lyrics put to each type. Uh, the artist, uh, which I believe is a four. Tyler, do you know if the main artist at Sleeping at Last is a four? I don't know. I think so. I think might, I, as well be every might as well be every number. Might as well be every number because he's written so well about it. Yeah. But in the in the process of, of making the record, he thought of the music, the way the, the wow. instruments would uh, be used in the song, the time signature, the cadence, the, the melody, and the lyrics all mm. through that type. That's beautiful. Yeah. So it's called the Enneagram. Um, and it's sleeping at last is the is the group. So as you're anticipating the release of more episodes, you can you can work your way through that album and um, be thinking through maybe what is coming up in you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if anybody wants to like write in about their self discovery process in this, like as we're talking about this, share a story. Um, I would love to read any of those emails and just connect with you guys in this journey and the process. Yeah. So. But one of the last pieces that is just coming to my mind now is that for me, the Enneagram is about, is about relationships and in that staying curious, like it's not useful to hold so rigidly Mm -hmm. to one type that you think you are, or if you're trying to explore someone else's type with them, the language that I use when I'm working with the Enneagram is like, let's try it on. Like, can Mm -hmm. we explain and feel validated in our experience by this type and some of the things that that type deals with or could we try a different way of looking at it um what was that language like for you it's helpful the um (laughs) the one in me (laughs) it felt feels very irritated with like having it wrong the first time <laughs> wrong the first time even that language <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and so i think I'm, I'm still kind of in the middle of like grappling with that of like what story do i want to write about that <laughs> right right <laughs> how do i want to make sense of that experience but um it does it feels supportive to think of like trying it on and and the reality being three years from now yeah who knows what part of myself I'll be like able to look at then that right. maybe I'm not seeing at all right now. Right. Exactly. And so it's a evolution. It's a process. It's life. Yes. It's human development. It's dynamic. It's complex. It's, it changes and moves and flows. And the beauty of the Enneagram is that in, you know, Richard Rohr talks about it this way that like you are this and you're always going to be this, mm-hmm. but your process to finding it, that's different. Yeah. You may not know. Hmm. I'm kind of hung up on this retreat thing. Please. Because what if we did a group retreat and really like got together and tried on Ooh. the type that we're exploring, but with other people in relationship, like as you're talking about, yeah. this should be done in relationship. Totally. But it, if you think about done in relationship with like safe people mm-hmm. and like, yeah. It, it would feel very vulnerable to explore it in a relationship that I didn't feel safe in, yeah. safe to be seen. I wouldn't be able to see it myself if because I wouldn't want anyone else to see it. Yeah. So I don't know. When you said that, I was just like, yeah. that, would oh, that would be really, be really cool, cool. Yeah. to organize something like that where we can all come together and spend a few days exploring. Yeah. It would be maybe really an idea wonderful. for the future. Yeah, tuck that away. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone likes that idea? Yeah. Send, me an email. send some support. Yeah. Jen <laughs> yeah. loves getting the emails about supporting her ideas. Yes. Like, oh, I ask for it. Usually I'm That's but... right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, stay tuned for more on the Enneagram uh, here at Beyond Trauma. And um, yeah, safe journeys, everyone. <laughs>